Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is Ted Laking, president of the Association of Yukon Communities and counselor for the city of Whitehorse. The Association of Yukon Communities serves as a unifying force for the diverse communities across the territory. With a mission to foster collaborations, the association's goal is to further the establishment of responsible government at the community level and to provide a united approach to community ambitions. The association assists communities in their endeavors to achieve and sustain strong and effective local governments, thereby improving the quality of life for all of the people of the territory. Through the advocacy, networking, resource sharing initiatives, AYCs empowers local leaders and promotes sustainable development, cultural preservations, and equitable access to services. From May 9th to May 11th, the Association of Yukon Communities will be gathering in Dawson City for their 49th annual convention and AGM. With that, Ted, welcome to the Political Trenches. Great. Thanks for having me back. So before we get into the crux of the of the show, let's kick it off with a simple question, and that is, what is the state of municipalities in the Yukon today? Yeah, well, I think that uh, one commonality that we have going on with all municipalities across the country is just the state of the financial sustainability of our organizations. Uh, we've uh, we're currently operating under an aged model of governance uh, that uh, is really rooted in the 1800s. And what we're finding is that the over-reliance on property taxes, particularly from residential property tax uh, payers, to uh, sustain and fund all of the significant challenges that we have as municipal governments isn't going to keep up for the long term. And what we've been doing through the Association of Yukon Communities is really trying to raise that red flag so that other levels of government can do their part to help us address this before it gets to mission critical. And we start uh, having uh, essential pieces of infrastructure that need to get replaced or fixed or built that uh, simply there's no money available to municipal governments. We're starting to get there. We're starting to see uh, some pieces of infrastructure in Whitehorse, for example, there's this uh, access point on the south end of town called Robert Service Way, which is the main way in and out of the downtown core of the city of Whitehorse for the south end of the territory. And it has been experiencing landslides for the last uh, two or three years now. And we estimate that the cost to fix that is going to be 60 to $70 million. A small community of 32,000 people can't, can't uh, realistically cover that on its own, but it is an essential uh, artery in and out, both for safety reasons, uh, you know, think of wildfires and escape plans out of a community, but also you know, accessing through um, the EMS to get to the southern end of the city, uh, or even just economically uh, for uh, traffic coming in and out of the south. And then just one other big one that's recently come up that wasn't on our radar uh, as recently as three years ago was we need a new water treatment plant, it looks like, in Whitehorse. Uh, we're starting to see uh, some hits of uh, not live giardia, but dead husks of it, which means that we're estimating we're going to need about $60, $70 million to build a new water treatment plant for the community because our water wells that we've been relying on uh, won't uh, um, be there for the long term. And so particularly, we also need that to support all of the uh, massive growth that we're seeing uh, throughout the country, but we're also experiencing it here in Whitehorse is one of the fastest growing cities. And as a result, the territory is one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in the country. And so there's a whole host of, of um, things coming down the pipe that we, we see because we go through our budgeting processes, but the other levels of government don't uh, necessarily see. And so that's what one of the big focuses that we've had as an association is making sure that the governments at uh, the other uh, levels are considering these uh, these things as they make their planning decisions as well. 
So you, you've mentioned the Federation of Canadian Municipalities call for a uh, trilateral, trilateral uh, meeting with provincial, territorial, and the federal government. Uh, I, I'm just off of SUMA this last few weeks, and I had the pleasure of asking that question to Premier Scott Moe of would they be willing, to, would Scott Moe be willing to sit down with the provincial level of government? Have you had that conversation with the Premier to address some of these issues? Because in, unless you ask them specifically, they will they will say they never been asked so have you had that conversation with the premier to say let's have that let's have that sit down with all levels of the, all provincial counterparts municipalities and the federal government not directly with the premier but with the uh, minister responsible for communities in the yukon i have and i would say uh the early reception is lukewarm i think that uh, provinces and territories are always um hesitant to, to give up uh, power or authority or to be the gatekeepers to municipalities. Uh, they, I mean, of course, we are creations of their provincial and territorial legislation, um, but uh, they, they don't um, really see us as, as really having the authority to go directly to the federal government. And so I think there's a hesitancy there. I don't think it's something that they should be afraid of though, in, in many ways, this helps them. This this takes stuff off their plate. This doesn't let the federal government get away with just doing the blame game of, oh, well, it's a municipal issue, so the province or the territory has to deal with it. No, if you get us all at the table, then the federal government has some ownership as well. The thing that I've always noticed uh, just in my dealings with uh, the federal government, either with uh, when I met with the prime minister or with the, uh, the various federal ministers I've met with or MPs, uh, or when I've met with uh, the territorial politicians is there's sort of this, uh, this bit of a finger pointing. And it says, uh, you know, the, the federal government does want to say, okay, municipalities, that sounds really good. Go get the province on board. And then you go to the province or the territory and they say, hey, that sounds really good, but really you need to get the feds on board. And both of them refuse to be in the same room with each other. And so you never know if their talking points are aligning or not. And it, it feels like this, this purposeful sort of uh, catch-22 they throw you in where you're just, you're in a spin cycle uh, with no way out. And, and uh, so that's why I think that FCM has really taken this on um, to, to take, take the initiative on this and, and have us take over the conversation and bring people to the table because the last decade or so of, of this, and it's not a partisan thing, this is across all political stripes, uh, is they they've tried to uh, basically uh, uh, snow you over with uh, process and bureaucracy and, and so we're saying no to that and it's time to get to the table i'd like to throw a couple of questions your way too here Ted, if i can you made the reference here to infrastructure funding and before that you were talking about some of the examples that you're seeing in whitehorse but um of course you're representing all the yukon communities are you seeing similar infrastructure issues or maybe I'm not sure if I'm putting words in your mouth when I say climate change related issues throughout the territory? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's obviously uh, infrastructure issues in all communities associated with climate change, but not just with climate change. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you need to remember for our communities is a lot of them haven't even seen the infrastructure that Southern communities have seen. And so as they grow, they're starting to need infrastructure that other communities have taken uh, uh, for granted for years. Think of things like rec centers or, or pools, th things that are, you know, you don't generally think of as, uh, hey, this is uh, an essential piece for a community to exist. But really, if you want a community to grow and you want families to stay there, you need to think about things like this. And so some of our communities that are just starting to grow and get to that sort of critical mass that would merit having uh, a community pool or, or a recreation facility. They need that initial investment. But yeah, with climate change, uh, not just Whitehorse has seen it, our, our community of Teslin has seen flooding, the community of Dawson has seen flooding. The community of Mayo uh, was uh, evacuated last year due to wildfires. And so we are seeing um, significant impacts due to it. And yeah, my, obviously my experience is deeply rooted in my time as a city councillor in Whitehorse, so I can speak with a lot more authority on 
the infrastructure needs of Whitehorse, but that's not to diminish the needs in the communities. I know one thing in particular that many of the communities have indicated is, that they need is with all of the demands being thrown in with growth and with immigration, they need significant new investment in underground infrastructure such as water and sewer. Mm -hmm. And um, so that th these are the types of challenges we're seeing. And just to circle back to the, the infrastructure pots we're seeing, we're not, we're always, we're, we're never going to say no to new infrastructure funding. We're always excited when a new infrastructure fund is rolled out, but the new infrastructure funds that are being rolled out are not going to do the trick when it comes to our needs. And, and if, if I'm saying that, I'm assuming that that's coming, uh, uh, probably a similar message coming across the country, because I can only imagine what, uh, you know, uh, large cities are, are facing, let alone, uh, you know, rural communities in northern Saskatchewan that don't even have road access. So this is a, a challenge and, and we need to all uh, come together to face it. I follow that up if I can with a, just more general question on the association. What other types of issues are you seeing or topics are you seeing that's important to uh, Yukoners, to local government in Yukon? Yeah, one of the big ones that we've seen, particularly over the last year and a half, is healthcare issues and uh, particularly human health resource issues. So shortages of doctors, nurses, EMS, things like that. And so this has been an issue that our membership's been very clear to me to take this on and to advocate on behalf of our membership on that. And this, it's kind of uh, out of the regular bailiwick of say municipal governance, but it's vitally important to us for the, uh, the sustainability of our communities. I'll just circle back to the, uh, an earlier comment I said about uh, recreation centers and pools being vital as a way to ensure that people will stay in their community long-term and raise their family. Same can be said with healthcare. That is uh, an essential service. And if you can't rely on uh, a nursing station being open or having access to EMS, well, chances are you will probably take your family to a place that you can rely on that. And what we saw last summer in the Yukon was really disappointing and that is rolling closures of uh, healthcare centers throughout all of rural Yukon. And we saw some communities have blackouts with no access to a nursing station for up to a month. And, uh, you know, we heard stories from people that were going through pregnancies at that time and needed to go for their regular checkups. And so now all of a sudden we're putting people that live in rural Yukon that need to drive six, seven hours to Whitehorse for a simple uh, checkup. And so this has been an issue that AYC has taken on. Another one that we saw um, over the last year was shortages and blackouts of EMS coverage. So, uh, and I, I always throw out this example because it just, it really highlights how it hits us all is last year we held our annual general meeting in Watson Lake Yukon. It's a uh, community of about 1500 people, uh, a, a few hours south of Whitehorse. So we had the premier, we had the minister, we had a bunch of territorial and federal officials there. What happens during that, uh, that weekend? Well, an EMS blackout. So you, even with all of these high profile politicians in this small community, we get a notification during our dinner on the first night Sorry, there's no EMS there, so <laughs> be careful tonight. Uh, but the the thing is, is it, when EMS isn't available, municipal governments are called often to, to fill in the gap through either our volunteer firefighters or our uh, full-time firefighters. And that means that we take on the liability, we take on the costs of response. And one of the issues that, to, and we're happy to do it, obviously, like if, if there's a member in your community in need of, of life-saving service, Firefighters, they're going to be there because this is this is why they signed up is to help the community. Uh, but it has a real administrative impact in that there's costs to uh, the municipal government. And, you know, take the case of Watson Lake, uh, for example. And I think I may have overstated when I said 1500. I think it's actually closer to a thousand, um, you know, small tax base. And uh, they, but they're called to to provide services that are traditionally the territorial government services. And we've run into issues of even getting reimbursed for that. And uh, when you have a small tax base, that can mean a difference between uh, making budget and not making budget. And so these are, uh, again, issues that sort of, they, they all sort of connect. They, how is it livable as your community and how financially sustainable is your community? 
I, I, I say we as the royal we as the provinces in, uh, under the 49th parallel often take it uh, take for granted sort of the collaborative work that municipalities play in uh, sort of the distance from each other. I'm, I'm here in Calgary and Chestermere, Airdrie, uh, Okotoks, even uh, Bragg Creek surrounds us. And there's a lot of feeder communities in the Yukon. You are spread out. And I say that as in the royal you as in you're municipalities go from one corner literally to the other and it's few and far between there is a collaborative effort though in the yukon from my conversations with some of your uh, uh, mayors and councillors that you rely on first nations communities with other municipalities who are close to you do you see a more collaborative effort between your uh, member communities and even the First Nation communities of the Yukon territories when you're addressing some of these pressing challenges? Because if the the territorial government, and the federal government aren't going to come to the table, you have to look at other options and working together is better than working alone. Yeah, that's a, it's a really great question. And um, this is actually one area that I'm quite proud of during my tenure as president is we've established what we call the Chiefs and Mayors Forum. And that brings together the mayors and the chiefs uh, of the Yukon. And the first ever one was held in October and we just held the second ever one last week. And it's an opportunity for our uh, community leaders to meet and discuss uh, issues of importance. So, uh, you know, you can't really fit it all into a one day uh, agenda. And we try to fit as much in as possible, but um, you know, we're all, we've, we've found even after two meetings, we've run out of time both times, but, you know, for example, I'll take the first meeting, for example, that's last October, and we really put a focus on the healthcare issue that I referenced, and in particular, substance abuse, the opioid crisis, and one of our communities, Mayo, Yukon, has been particularly hard hit by this. I think that um, they may have, uh, if not the highest per capita death rate as a result of opioids in the country. And it, it's had severe impacts on the communities. Everybody's hit by this. Everybody knows somebody that has either uh, been lost to this or, um, you know, is friends with them. And so they, uh, what we did at the Chiefs and Mayors Forum is we took a united voice and we wrote, uh, myself and the Grand Chief of the Council of Yukon First Nations, we wrote a, uh, a letter to the premier asking them to take uh, more urgent uh, um, measures to address this. And so these are the types of things that we exactly, as you said, uh, when we're having trouble with the territorial, the federal governments, maybe putting the proper amount of attention on an issue we think is important, we believe we can come together and we are louder as uh, one voice. And we can be a, a pretty big voice for change. And, uh, you know, this past week, what we focused on was wildfires. We're coming into the wildfire season. We have presentations from uh, a local organization, Yukon First Nation Wildfire. And we had uh, presentations from the government to Yukon. And I'll tell you, it was, it was a, a two-hour discussion. It was frank. It was open. It was honest. And uh, I was pretty proud of the, the mayors and the chiefs. They really, they, they grilled the, these guys on... Uh, on how they're preparing because we've seen what's happened in other jurisdictions and you know we're very lucky we were we dodged a bullet uh, as we see it last year in the Yukon uh, but we're surrounded by forest as well and we're not going to dodge bullets forever and so we need to be ready and we know our citizens are concerned and so absolutely we're going to continue to to press the importance of uh, the having our two levels of government work together. How do you ensure, as president of the AYC and your organization, ensure that all the diverse issues are addressed, that each municipality, because you, you talked about Mayo seeing a very big uh, substance abuse, I'm assuming in Watson Lake, because it is surrounded by a forest. Forest fire is a big concern for them there. In Dawson uh, City, which uh, Ian and I have chatted about on this show, we, we've talked about sort of the uh, shadow population that the community is seeing and sort of the need for 
for infrastructure based on the entire population, just not the residents of the community. How do you as the association sort of navigate the uh, individual issues that communities face and approach the territorial government and say, these are the challenges that we need to talk about this year because these are the most pressing ones? Or is it a, a consensus in some sense to say, okay, these are our issues and we're going to address them as one and not as 10 different communities? You know, it, it's a it's an interesting question, an interesting challenge. The, the thing that I've found over my two years is as much as the issues may seem a bit different in the way that they are either manifesting themselves or the way that the community has focused on them, there's often a lot of common denominators uh, amongst them. And it may just be that the community uh, is, is particularly focused on this one issue, but one thing that I found is when a community brings to the executive or the board of directors of AYC an issue that they've identified is something as simple as just start shopping that issue around to the other mayors and councillors. Have you heard this? What's, what are your thoughts on this? And, and slowly you start to suss out that you know, they're experiencing it too. They just haven't either identified it yet, or it could be you know, a bit lower because something else like, you know, a wildfire is happening right now. So we're not so worried about that, the shadow population or that peripheral issue uh, or the peripheral user issue. And so I think uh, the, the challenge that we have, as you said, is we're so spread out. But the great thing is things like Zoom and stuff that have uh, or, or kind of like the silver lining that have come out of the pandemic is it's really expanded our, our modes of communication and our ability to do things uh, like host meetings um, over over the internet, and it's really it's actually caused a lot more. Uh, I see investment in um, internet technology. I mean, the Association of Yukon Communities we've recently inv uh, invested in some of those Starlink dishes because we found that when we're going into communities, there the rec centers, as I mentioned, sometimes the infrastructure is a little outdated, and the internet simply cannot support our hybrid meeting capacity. And so what we've done is we've said, well, you know, uh, what we'll do is we'll invest in the satellite technology and we'll just bring it around with us. Uh, and so that's been one way that we've done it. And, and I find that it, it, it is for a volunteer job as president of the Association of Income Communities, it's a lot of work, but you learn a lot and it's really rewarding. And, and uh, uh, I, I've really enjoyed sort of kind of plug in the, the different pieces of the puzzle into different people's uh, uh, communities and, and seeing how it adapts. And oftentimes, um, you know, when you take one community's issue and you ask another community how, you know, what do they think? Sometimes what we found is they said, oh yeah, yeah, we've actually dealt with the issue and we dealt with it like this. I mean, you can go back to the other community and say, what about this? And, and sometimes you haven't had to elevate it to the level of like uh, the political level because, you were able to uh, not reinvent the wheel, and uh, and so th th it's it's a lot of communication, really. I think your your uh, comment around Starlink and some of the technological changes, I think, is quite interesting. And you, as long as you've been involved in local government, whether it's AYC or whether it's through the city of, uh, of Whitehorse, what are some of the biggest change you may have seen in terms of the structure or uh, requirements or uh, the outcomes that local government in Yukon has? Yeah, I think that uh, there's a couple of things I, and they're not, I would say not really technology wise, I would say that they're more of expectation wise. Um, the municipal councillors in the Yukon are part time jobs right. and, and Whitehorse is we're a bit higher up on a pay scale so there's a bit more expectation. But I think that most people expect of the municipal councillors in all communities to be a full-time job. And that's partly because the issues, that there's this certain sense of urgency on a lot of these major issues. We've identified a lot of big issues, uh, housing, uh, population growth, climate change, major issues. But now that everybody's primed, okay, let's come up with solutions. And there's more and more demands being put on local uh, government leaders. And so what it is challenged all of us is how do we maximize our outreach and engagement with our community, our uh, limited time, because we all have day jobs as well, to go out, do the necessary research and bring a reasoned argument uh, to do this. And 
with that comes strained resources on our staff as well. You know, some White Horse has, you know, uh, several hundred staff, but some of these smaller communities have a dozen staff or less. And so to deal with issues like housing and climate change, it's really difficult. I, I look at the, the federal government's housing accelerator fund that they rolled out with best of intentions. And this was to help uh, get infrastructure money in the hand of municipalities so they can do things like get ready for uh, more housing to be built. But the turnarounds and the red tape required was unrealistic for small communities. And mm -hmm. so it's not even just the expectations from our own constituents that have increased, but other levels of government have increased their expectations on us. But you circling back to our financial sustainability uh, discussion earlier, without the ability to ramp up to meet those expectations, you're setting us up for failure. And so that is certainly uh, a big change that, that we've seen. And one of the things that why I get so excited about this when, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, I think that I annoy my territorial and federal counterparts because I, you know, I'm always banging the desk of this, but it's really important. The, another uh, big change that I haven't necessarily seen, but the next person in my seat is going to see is during our time here uh, be, to kind of address some of these uh, major issues that I've identified. We determined that a three year municipal term wasn't enough. Uh, you know, I, uh, speaking from experience, I'm a newbie to all this. And it took about six, seven months to really just figure out how things work. And now we're coming to the last five, six months and things are winding down. Um, you know, we're not gonna be able to make big changes. Uh, the rightly so, the municipal staff are gonna start, you know, putting off some big things because they know that uh, there's gonna be a new council coming in in October. And so we decided we needed a four year term. We asked the um, uh, territorial government to make that necessary change. And so starting this election, municipal uh, politicians will be in for four year terms. And so I'm, I'm excited for that change. I think it's the right thing to do. It might have uh, some unintended consequences as it may, re, uh, you know, four years is a lot longer than three years. And so uh, it, people may rethink whether or not they wanna do it, but I think what you'll see is more consistency and more long-term strategic thinking. And uh, I'm excited to see how that one will go. Thanks. So my, my last question for you then, you mentioned immigration a little while ago and population growth and that sort of thing. How do you attract people into Yukon and to, I mean, to your job as well? How do you attract them into being interested in either elected or appointed roles in local government in Yukon? Yeah, well, you know, it's almost like one of those, I don't know what the secret sauce is up here in the Yukon because we don't seem to have any trouble attracting anyone. It's, I don't know if it, it it's a beautiful place. And Chris is gonna see this in a couple of weeks when he's up in Dawson, but it is, it is absolutely stunning up here. If you love the summer, this is the place to be. Uh, you know, you're living in, in many of the communities, you are out in untouched trail territory of like Boreal Forest within five minute drive of your, uh, of your uh, back porch. So. That's fantastic. Um, the housing is a struggle up here, but you know, it partly it's a struggle up here because the growth, like I said, we're, we're one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in the country. Um, so as for recruitment efforts or trying to, to get people uh, here, I, I don't see that as a challenge. I think whatever we're doing is working and that's great because we have a labor shortage as well. Um, but, uh, and um, my apologies again, what was the second part of the question? No, how do you get people, are you finding enough people who are interested and involved in local government? Yeah, so there you go, that's, that's a great point. And so there's a couple aspects. Uh, last year, AYC, we passed a resolution to ask the territorial government to do some research into the possibility of extending the right to vote to permanent residents. And that was really with, uh, brought forward with the recognition that uh, permanent residents are integral members of the community. They, they pay taxes, they often own uh, or run small businesses, uh, are a huge component of addressing the labor shortage, and you know, they're, they're growing a segment of the population. And so uh, the, the government of Yukon's taken that and is doing some, uh, I think, cross-jurisdictional analysis 
that's one way to do it. Another discussion that uh, is being brought forward at our AGM in Dawson is a similar concept, but this time around uh, the voting age. And so there's lots of discussions about does that expand um, interest in municipal government? But also one thing that this uh, that AYC has uh, taken an interest in is being more vocal and more visible. So we are more involved in the community either at uh, major events. Um, you know, we've uh, recently there's this thing called the Arctic Inspiration Prize, which uh, it sponsors or uh, rewards entrepreneurial groups from across the territories uh, for unique ideas such as uh, arts and culture or uh, traditional knowledge. And so this year for the first time, the Association of Newcomb Communities nominated uh, a group for that. And so um, we're, you know, we're fingers crossed that uh, when the awards are doled out in a couple of weeks, that uh, there's some good news there. But these are the types of ways is that we want people to realize that, uh, you know, it's the, the city or the municipality doesn't just exist when your property tax notice comes at the year and you can shake your fist at the cloud and curse us. There's a whole lot of things that we do that are important. As I mentioned, recreational facilities. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I think Chris asked me the first time we did this interview, what's the thing that you're most surprised about and you weren't expecting? At the time I said waste management. I'm changing my answer today. Today, <laughs> it is traffic calming. In particularly in residential neighborhoods, I've I've heard so much about people speeding uh, down a boulevard in an area. Um, you know, I would say traffic. I wasn't surprised about like you know gridlock and you know it takes me thirty minutes to get to work or whatever. That's probably on the low side for Calgary, but for Whitehorse, that's thirty minutes is a lot. Uh, but it's it's the small sort of low hanging fruit things like or hey this the stop sign I don't like it where it's placed it's a blind spot it's these types of things and and I get a, I I really enjoy those ones actually because those are relatively easy problems to fix but they mean a lot to people and they they really feel like uh, you know wow you know the city council listened to me on this and you know we got a speed bump in front of our house and that. It's going to make our kids safer. And I think it's those types of things and then that kind of word of mouth that gets out there that your municipal leaders and uh, are listening and, and addressing and people kind of, I think, will get more interest in like, oh, I can make a bit of a difference. And, um, you know, it's it's sometimes it's the small things, but that's OK. So I have one final question here. And of course, we were we started, we talked about the upcoming AGM, which is happening from May 9th to May 11th in Dawson City. Uh, I will be on hand. I'm looking forward to meeting some of the mayors and councillors and having them sit down and chat with them about their big issues and what they're eye opening. And I'm assuming it's probably going to be wastewater management or roads, as you just said. What what can delegates expect to hear at this year's AGM in Dawson City, or what can we expect to see come out of this AGM and conference in Dawson? Well, I'm really excited you're coming because this is going to be this is going to be one for the ages, in my view. And I'm setting the bar really high now, so oops. But we have some fantastic presenters. We have uh, uh, um, Sammy Joe Small, who is a Olympic gold medalist for Team Canada Women's Hockey. Uh, a several time world champion as well, uh, former MVP. She was a goaltender for Team Canada. Um, she's coming to present on kind of what I just talked about is the importance of, that you can bring to a team by not being, uh, by being more than just, uh, you know, the spotlight or, or doing the really grandiose thing, doing the little things and, and helping your team in that way. Uh, speaking to the, and we, we see a significant overlap in that message with the role of municipal governance. And so we have Sammy Joe come. We also have um, a, uh, a Mayor Williams from Yellowhead County from Alberta attending. We have uh, Councillor Carol Westerland from RMA who's attending. And we are going to be hosting a panel on emergency wildfire preparedness. And they will be part of that. And we're going to have some of, we'll have uh, a local mayor, Mayor Ellis from Mayo, which I mentioned earlier, got evacuated last year. He'll be part of that panel. And we're also going to have some of the operational folks 
involved in what would be an evacuation and a Yukon context. And so we're hoping that our members get a lot of value out of that. And then we also have another um, really interesting keynote speaker named Caleb Dahlgren. And he is a survivor of the Humboldt Bronco uh, tragedy. And he's coming to talk about the importance of communities for resilience and mental health and how communities uh, helped him on his path to recovery. And so we see a lot of value there. And we're hoping for, for uh, some federal representation. Of course, our member of parliament will be there. Our senator will be there. And we've also received confirmation that the deputy leader of the Conservative Party of Canada will be in attendance to speak. Uh, we're waiting to hear back from the, um, the NDP as well as Minister Sean Fraser. So we, we're, we're starting to get quite the lineup of folks. Uh, my executive director, um, I, I'm probably driving her insane because every day I'm like, hey, this person's going to present. And I said, that's no problem. And uh, she's telling me, stop saying yes to everybody. So uh, it's a full agenda. It's, uh, it, it, it's going to be great. And uh, we're hosting it in the Palace Grand Theatre, which is a Parks Canada historical building. It's like a Gold Rush era theatre hall. It really reminds you of like one of those old theater houses with like, it's all wood. There's the, the opera boxes up high and uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be amazing. So we're really excited to, to host it there in Dawson City. Dawson City is my hometown, born and raised there. So bringing everybody back to the hometown and uh, it's going to be really cool. I, well, I, I'm looking forward to it and it's going to be fun. I'm going to have to reach out to RMA and some of those mayors that you talked about and see if we can uh, piggyback and see if they want to do a little road trip up to Dawson City with me. Um, Dad, uh, like Ian and I, Lampoon's. pardon me? I feel like National Lampoon's vacation. <laughs> there you go. Oh, it's with Wayne and Carrie, you never know. <laughs> um, Ted, uh, we want to thank you so much for joining us today on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Uh, you are a wealth of knowledge, and we will certainly have the open invitation if you ever want to come back on and talk about anything to do with Yukon community. So thank you so much. Thanks very much for having me both. And uh, yeah, this is really great. I really enjoy your show. I, I really enjoy the, the advocacy and the support for municipal governments. Sometimes we, we're the forgotten uh partner in in confederation and but it's so important and i i really appreciate the the platform that you've provided for a, a lot of these issues that i see is so important 